right. Well, good morning. It is good to be here with you guys. It is a beautiful Easter Sunday morning. Um, I just feel so very thankful to be able to gather together in this space with each of you. Um, if you are visiting with us, a special welcome to you and to those who are joining us online or somewhere down the line. Hello. Um, we are going to give this portion of worship back to Jesus, and then we will jump right in. So, Heavenly Father, we thank you. Thank you just seems to pale in comparison for the trade-off of what you did, but we are so very thankful. We are thankful for the Holy Spirit, and we invite the Holy Spirit into this space to move and to breathe and to touch lives in ways that only he can. We thank you, Jesus. We pray that the words are your words and that you are the only one that is seen. And we love you so very much. And it is in your name that we pray. Amen. All right, so we are in Acts chapter 13. I cannot believe we're in Acts chapter 13. We have been journeying through this for that many weeks. Um, when I was with you guys last, we had seen Saul's powerful conversion. Remember we said that he jumped right into serving like a mento being dropped in a bottle of Coke. He just exploded onto the scene. And many people received his message, many people hated his message, some people even wanted him dead. So the disciples, they send him back to his place of birth, and he spends several years there growing and learning. And over the course of the weeks that follow, Tony and Chris, they did this stellar job of sharing Peter's story, how the gospel message continued to spread, how, P how Peter, after powerful prayers from the believers and some assistance from some pretty awesome angels, escapes prison. Uh, we saw further persecution, the execution of James at the hand of Herod. And we saw Herod struck down with this brutal illness that I know we all hope we never will get, and that was being eaten from the inside out, from worms. Why? Because he received praise that was truly praise for God. And then we saw Barnabas and Saul, and they were working closely in this church of Antioch. And that is where believers were first called Christians, which I think is pretty cool. So that's actually where we pick back up today, with Barnabas and Saul in Antioch of Syria. The chapter opens in one Antioch, and it closes in a completely different location, where Saul will eventually land, and that is Antioch of Pisidia, or for us, southern Turkey. This chapter is where Saul, he becomes the dominant figure in the book of Acts, and the focus, it shifts off of the disciples from Jerusalem, so James, John, and Peter, and it moves solely to Saul, who for the first time will officially be referred to as Paul. And we have seen and we will continue to see his awesome journey of spiritual growth. We've seen him saved, we've seen him begin to serve, we've even seen him set apart where he had to spend time working and growing and learning. And that journey for him has been 10 years in the making. And I think that we can easily forget that because for us, this has been 13 weeks. But for him, it's been 10 years. So because of the persecution in Jerusalem, it has been really intense. It began immediately after the stoning of Stephen. Many of the believers scattered. The complaint against them was effectively, hey, you guys have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine. In other words, we're good. Like, we've heard enough. You can go. And if you're not going to go, we'll give you some pretty strong motivation to help you on your way out. So when that happened, Barnabas went to Antioch. And Saul, at this point, he has been with him for about a year. And this church that they're working in, it really becomes this mission church. Together, Barnabas and Saul, they will go off on their first missionary journey together. So the word church in Greek means ekklesia, right? I think we've heard that, ekklesia, or called out ones. Originally, the idea of an ecclesia, it was really rooted in the cultural meaning of the word. It didn't have any spiritual foundation. 
It was basically just a group of citizens who left their homes to go and hang out for a designated purpose. So it's just this gathering of people with a common interest. However, as time went on and the Christian faith grew and more and more gatherings are taking place, this ecclesia morphs from a cultural meaning to one specifically intent for the Christian people who were called to gather together for the purpose of living out and sharing the good news of Jesus. And the reason that I say any of that is I think that we need to remember that from all the way back to the beginning, the church didn't necessarily look a specific way structurally. It was a gathered group of people. So when we say we're going to church, no, we're just really going to a place where believers are gathered. But this time for us on Sunday mornings, it is intentionally set apart. It's designated for us to come together so that we are able to learn and grow from one another, that we're able to fellowship and encourage and worship and support, even hold accountable, but then be sent back out on mission. So what the space looks like is really far less important than what the time spent in that space produces. The gathering together matters. <laughs> it matters immensely because of what the time does in the collective and in the individual. But for us, we get in these first few verses this glimpse inside this early church in Antioch. So let's take a look at verse 3. Now in the church of Antioch, there were prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Menaean, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. While they were worshiping and the Lord while they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. So after they had fasted and prayed, they placed their hands on them and they sent them off. So prophets and teachers, these were the two main gifts that were present at this time. Think about the necessity of that. There was no New Testament to learn from. The New Testament didn't exist for them to draw from. So prophets and teachers, they were this instrumental way that the message was shared. But think about this. Through that, they're ultimately writing the story of it. Through every act of obedience that they took, they're writing the story of the New Testament as they lived their everyday lives. I think that is a crazy thing to think about because they would have had no idea what their obedience would mean for us. And I hope that that makes you think about your story, about the story that is being written through you. Do you know your story matters? Do you believe that your story counts for something beyond here and now? Do you realize that the things that you do in your everyday life have the opportunity to have kingdom impact that they're supposed to? Because we, just like early believers, we have no idea what our obedience means to those around us, whether that's seen and felt in the here and now or years down the road. The everyday of our lives is part of the chapters that are still being written in the kingdom story. And there's significance in that. Now, in the verses that we just read, there were five men. And what that says to me is that the church doesn't have to be big to be effective. This is a beautifully diverse group of guys. They've gathered from their unique backgrounds for a united purpose. They're praying and they're fasting, and the Holy Spirit comes upon them. There's power in those men being together. Nothing has changed from the early church to today in regard to the importance of our taking time to gather together as a body. I have wrestled through this thought for weeks, and if I'm going to be upfront and honest with you, as I very much always want to be, this is a challenging thing to say. Um, as many of you know, the position that I am in, that Tony and I are in together, it wasn't something that we sought out. It was presented to us. 
And through that, and laying it at Jesus' feet, it became clear that he was indeed leading us to walk through the doors that were opened. And I have to say, it has been and it continues to be one of the most humbling and surrendered experiences of my life. And I am very thankful. It has also been difficult. You see things differently as your perspective changes, right? I mean, that makes sense. But the difficulty may not be in ways that you might expect. Through this process, there has been a lot of shifting of thoughts and priorities. And for me, that is a really good thing. And one of those shifts, it pertains to church attendance. A barometer of success of a church has in part always been measured by the number of people in the seats. And I don't say that so that you shift in your seat. Please know that is not my heart's intent. But I do ask that you hear me out. I say that because I'm no longer bothered by it, and I'm deeply bothered by it at the same time. See, I'm no longer bothered by it in the sense that I don't believe that to be an accurate measure of success. I think that that is a worldly form of measurement. So as a result, I'm not concerned with air quote success in that way, in the least. But I'm deeply bothered by it in the sense that there continues to be purpose in us gathering together that's missed when that doesn't happen. There are gifts and there are talents that each believer has that is designated to enhance and help the body of Christ function at its full potential. And that's what's missed when we all don't show up. This isn't said with the heart of, hey, we need you here to work. It's really said with the heart of, I think of the person who is searching. I think of the loved ones that we are praying for who do not yet know Jesus yet in a real, tangible, like touchable way. I think about the person who's finally worked up the courage to walk through the doors. And more than anything, I want them to walk into a body that's fully alive. A body where all of the parts are working in unity for a common purpose. And that's to shine the love of Jesus with all cylinders firing. I'm not talking about like fog machines and gimmicks to get people through the doors. I'm talking about all of the unique ways that we are wired coming together at the same time so that Jesus is glorified and lives are transformed. There's power in us gathering together that can't be replicated in any other way. So as these men are worshiping and they're fasting, the Holy Spirit tells them, hey, I need you guys to set apart Barnabas and Saul. Now think about that. There's five of them, and the Holy Spirit is taking two of them. That had to feel kind of overwhelming. So then they lay hands on them, just a way of recognizing that God has laid his hands on them. And Barnabas and Saul, they take off. They sail to Cyprus, and they preach in Jewish synagogues the gospel of Jesus Christ. So they gather together, they learn and they grow, they worship, and then God moves them on. Verse 6. Afterward, they traveled from town to town across the entire island until finally they reached Paphos, where they met a Jewish sorcerer, a false prophet named Bar-Jesus. He had attached himself to the governor, Sergius Paulus, who was an intelligent man. The governor invited Barnabas and Saul to visit him, for he wanted to hear the word of God. But Elymas, the sorcerer, as his name means in Greek, interfered and urged the governor to pay no attention to what Barnabas and Saul said. He was trying to keep the governor from believing. So the fact that this man is noted as being a Jew and a sorcerer is pretty remarkable. Being of Jewish faith and practicing sorcery would have resulted in capital punishment, in death. But notice also his name is Bar-Jesus. That means son of Jesus. Now, we can read that and we can be like, hey, you know what? Neither one of those things really sounds great. I think we have to pay attention to why that information was shared. 
See, this man wasn't just practicing sorcery and like advertising himself in the local, I don't know, scroll as a sorcerer. What he would have been doing was mixing the Jewish faith that he had, which is why he's being told to us that he's a Jew. So he's taking the Jewish faith that he has and he's mixing in sorcery. So he's got like this little dash of this and this little dash of that and like you've got this custom religion. But notice how he's described. Is he described as a man of faith? Is he described as a lover of God? No. He's described as a sorcerer, even though there are elements of faith in what he's practicing. I think that, too, should make us stop and think. See, there's a lot of talk about people deconstructing their faith. Now, it's one thing to wrestle through your faith. We are encouraged to wrestle through our faith. But it is something entirely different to break it down only to then put the pieces back that each individual feels is relevant to them. Essentially holding on to pieces of Jesus, maybe a cause of Jesus, rather than with the entirety of him. Because when you identify with a cause, you get to focus on that one thing something that you happen to like and that you agree with, and you can be passionate about it, and you can profess that it's true and right and good, and that might be the case. But it, if it's not full of the full picture of Jesus, then it isn't the gospel of Jesus. Because unfortunately, the way that human nature works, we just can't help but throw our thoughts and our views into the mix so what we end up with is this dash of Jesus, the cause that we're passionate about, but then we add in other ingredients. Can you tell I'm a baker? We add in things that we feel will enhance the pot. But if those other ingredients are not full of the will of Jesus, inevitably they're full of the will of ourselves. And we end up with a religion that's more about us than about him. Jesus is the whole story. He's the beginning and the end. He doesn't need anything added to him. And anything less than all of him is just a knockoff. It's a counterfeit. But we're so enticed by things that we think will make us feel good or look good or not have to change. So the sorcerer is effective. He's taking this smorgasbord faith and he's sharing it with people who knew only a little bit of truth. People not grounded in the whole story. And he's working his magic on them. Pun fully intended. So he's attached himself to Sergius Paulus, this proconsul or a governor in Cyprus, which is a senatorial province of Rome. Sergius Paulus, he's up there. In the political system, he is successful, but he's hungry for more than what the world is offering. Think of all that he's hearing. He's hearing about Jesus. He's hearing that he's eradicated sin. And he's like, what? There's, there's got to be more to this story. And he wants to know about it. Here he's got this sorcerer always at his side, probably pumping him up and telling him how great he is. But the governor wants to know about the real Jesus. So he invites Barnabas and Saul and the counterfeit Jesus. Well, he doesn't want anything to do with that. Verse 9. Saul, also known as Paul, was filled with the Holy Spirit, and he looked the sorcerer in the eye. So this is the first time that Saul is referred to as Paul. Saul was his Hebrew name. It would have been given to him on the day of his circumcision. But Paul was his Roman name, given to him on his ninth day of life. Paul means diminutive one or little guy, which that kind of makes me laugh. I don't know that it necessarily means that he was a little guy. I mean, at nine days old, let's face it, he was a little guy. But it was his Roman name. But now we get to call him just Paul, not Saul, also known as Paul. And it makes sense because he is the apostle to the Gentiles where he will bring the message of Jesus Christ. Now, Paul is a Roman legally. His father had Roman citizenship. He was a Greek culturally. He was well-versed in that culture. 
He was a Jew religiously. He was a trained rabbi. But now he is a follower of Christ, only by the grace of God. And he knows it. He's not afraid of people. He's not afraid to tell the story of Jesus. And because of his story, all that led him to this point, he's influential in many different arenas of life. Now, influential doesn't necessarily mean popular. It certainly doesn't mean that everybody liked him. It just means that he was able to confidently step into those places and bring it. And bring it, he does. So we just read that Paul was filled with the Holy Spirit. I think it's easy when we read words like that to think that nice things are about to come out of his mouth. Not like rainbows and unicorns nice. I don't think Paul's that kind of guy. But words maybe of love and maybe a lightness and an effervescence to them. But remember the Holy Spirit is intent on pointing us to Christ. And part of that entails convicting us correcting us when we get off track. And in this man's case, in the sorcerer's case, the Holy Spirit is not going to allow Christ to be mocked. And he's not going to allow deceit to spread. So Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, he is going to speak words of light and truth for Christ and this man, although for him they are more of a rebuke. Verse 10. Then Paul said, You son of the devil, full of every sort of deceit and fraud, an enemy of all that is good. Will you never stop perverting the true ways of the Lord? Watch now, for the Lord has laid his hands of punishment on you, and you will be struck blind. You will not see the sunlight for some time. Instantly mist and darkness came over the man's eyes, and he began groping around, begging for someone to take his hand and lead him. Think about what Paul has just told this man. I mean, first of all, he's told him he's the son of the devil. I have to think that stung a little bit. But also, Paul has told him, stop perverting the true ways of Jesus. He's like, you can't customize what's already been tailor-made. And he tells him the result of that is going to be blind. But clearly, Paul knows a little bit about that. On the road to Damascus, that's exactly how the Lord got a hold of him. So he knows personally what it is to wrestle through his faith in the dark. I don't think that was probably his most fun experience. But he came out of it on the side of truth, surrendered. And maybe that is what he hopes that this man will do as well, that in his darkness, he'll find the light of Christ. Verse 12, when the governor saw what had happened, he became a believer, for he was astonished at the teaching about the Lord. See, God's working all the time, and it always has kingdom purpose. The Holy Spirit is working, drawing us to the truth of Jesus Christ, the truth of what he did on our behalf. The fortunate thing and the unfortunate thing is that we're part of that equation, And we have to decide if our heart is open to want to know more, like the governor, or are we blind? Are we so focused on tweaking things or avoiding things or denying things for our benefit? Let's continue. Verse 13. Paul and his companions then left Paphos by ship for Pamphylia, landing at the port town of Perga. There John Mark left them and returned to Jerusalem, but Paul and Barnabas traveled inland to Antioch of Pisidia. On the Sabbath, they went to the synagogue for services. After the usual readings from the books of Moses and the prophets, those in charge of the service sent them this message, Brothers, if you have any word of encouragement for the people, come and give it. See, in every synagogue, there was a liturgy service. There was a specific flow and order of events, and part of that would be a reading, followed by a commentary on that reading that was either done by a leader in the synagogue or by a visiting rabbi. And Paul, because of his history, he's a visiting rabbi. And he responds to their invitation. For us, this is Paul's first recorded message in the scriptures. This radical rabbi, radically transformed, who gives this message of grace and faith that at the time was absolutely radical. 
But unfortunately today, because we've heard it so often, we may not fully recognize how revolutionary it was and how revolutionary it still is, how life-changing and refreshing the gospel message of Jesus was to a people so rooted in religion to receive a message of relationship. So Paul stands and he lifts his hands to quiet them and he says, Men of Israel and you God-fearing Gentiles, listen to me. And he proceeds to go through their entire Jewish history, from Moses to Samuel to Saul and David and John the Baptist. And he testifies that Jesus was the very descendant that the prophets spoke about, that he was and is the Messiah. He is the promised Savior of Israel. This whole first part of his message, it's all about the days where the Jewish people anticipated their Messiah. Paul is doing here what Stephen did, right? It was something that the Jewish people were fond of doing and hearing themselves because often they would rehearse their own history to other Jewish people. God worked in the past. God is working in the present. God is going to work in the future. They would tell their story from one generation to the next to encourage them, to keep it alive. And Paul, he's attempting to reach them through a method they would not be able to question or deny. So after he lays the foundation of their heritage, he connects it to how their Jewish people, probably also some of these specific people as well, treated and received Jesus. Verse 26, brothers, you sons of Abraham and also you God-fearing Gentiles, this message of salvation has been sent to us. The people in Jerusalem and their leaders did not recognize Jesus as the one the prophets spoke about. Instead, they condemned him, and in doing this, they fulfilled the prophets' words that are read every Sabbath. They found no legal reason to execute him, but they asked Pilate to have him killed anyway. It says they fulfilled the prophets' words that are read every Sabbath. Essentially, what is being said is you can have a full head of knowledge, but an empty heart. Paul is saying when Jesus came, you ignored the very words you read all the time. They're words you know in your head, but you will not allow yourself to know those words in your heart. Jesus himself said, you search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life. But these are they which testify of me. Paul continues, verse 29. When they had done all that the prophets said about him, they took him down from the cross and they placed him in a tomb. But God raised him from the dead. And over a period of many days, he appeared to those who had gone with him from Galilee to Jerusalem. They are now his witnesses to the people of Israel. We've said this before, but in the New Testament preaching, the resurrection, it is the common thread. It is the capstone of Christianity. The resurrection is what allows us to live in new life, just as Jesus lived after conquering sin. The resurrection is what victory over sin and death and the promise for eternal life are rooted in. So it's spoken of over and over again. And Paul highlights, just as Stephen highlighted, there were hundreds of witnesses to Jesus' resurrection. Hundreds of people saw him and knew who he was. So this isn't a myth. It's not another great story. It's proven fact. It's why we're gathered together today to celebrate our risen Savior. Verse 32. And now we are here to bring you this good news. The promise was made to our ancestors, and God has now fulfilled it for us, their descendants, by raising Jesus. Brothers, listen. We're here to proclaim that through this man, Jesus, there's forgiveness for your sins. Everyone who believes in him is made right in God's sight, something the law of Moses could never do. And as he spoke, The people's hearts are opening. 
The people begged him to come back and speak the following week. It's like a dry desert just with water pouring down on it. And they're so hungry and they're so thirsty. And the cracks in that desert are coming back to life. Verse 44, it says that the next week, almost the entire city came to hear them speak. Now, unfortunately, we're humans. We don't always like other people succeeding when we don't. Some of the Jews were jealous of the crowds that gathered. So they, rather than receiving the message, they stood there and they slandered and they argued with everything that was said. But I love Paul and Barnabas' Barnabas's response. They don't argue back. They don't take the bait. They don't get discouraged. Verse 46 says, Then Paul and Barnabas spoke out boldly and declared, It was necessary that we first preach the word of God to you Jews. But since you have rejected and judged yourselves unworthy of eternal life, we will offer it to the Gentiles. Paul and Barnabas were focused on speaking the truth. Period. Whether the truth stung or the truth transformed was ultimately in the hands of the listener. They didn't repackage the message. They didn't water down the message. Their love for Christ, their knowledge of the truth of Christ, would not allow them to share anything other than the full story of Christ, regardless of what it meant for them personally, regardless of how the message was received. That's why it is so important for us for believers in Christ, that we are personally grounded in the true, full picture of Jesus? You know, as we think about our story, as we continue to live the story of God through our everyday lives, the only lasting impact that we can make is connected to our ability to convey to others what Jesus' death and resurrection meant for us? See, we're accountable for what we refuse to see in the gospel story. But we're also accountable for what we're unable to see because of the sin in our lives. And those two things directly impact the story that we tell. See, if you're a believer, you are part of a bigger body than your own. And you can only lose so many fingers before you no longer have a hand, or so many toes before you no longer have a foot. As followers of Christ, the reality is we don't get to sit this round out. Our participation matters. It matters not just for what others are missing out on when we don't show up, but also because a finger, when it falls off of a hand, it only stays pink and fully alive for so long. There is a world desperately in need of the touch of Jesus, desperately in need of hope, of peace. But Jesus did all of the hard work. He did. I know we think we go through hard things, and we do go through hard things, but Jesus did the hardest of the things. And the greatest thing that we can do is to continue to tell his story through the story of what he has done through us. But we are accountable that that story is the true representation of the grace and truth of Jesus Christ. That story is the only story that will transcend time. There is a pastor by the name of S.M. Lockridge he was a pastor at Calvary Baptist Church in California. He was known for his powerful preaching there, but also all around the world. Decades ago, he gave a message entitled, Amen. And this message went on for over an hour. It was highly impacting. But it was what happened at the end of his message that left the listeners in tears and continues to do so. And it was his benediction. His benediction was this impromptu overflow of his heart description of who Jesus is. 
Today, it is commonly referred to as, that's my king. So in his words, this is a powerful reminder of who it truly is all about. Let's listen. The Bible says my king is the king of the Jews. He's the king of Israel. He's the king of righteousness. He's the king of the ages. He's the king of heaven. He's the king of glory. He's the king of kings. And he's the Lord of lords. That's my king. I wonder do you know him? My king is a sovereign king. No means of measure can define his limitless love. He's enduringly strong. He's entirely sincere. He's eternally steadfast. He's immortally graceful. He's imperially powerful. He's impartially merciful. Do you know him? He's the greatest phenomenon that has ever crossed the horizon of this world. He's God's son. He's a sinner's savior. He's the centerpiece of civilization. He's unparalleled. He's unprecedented. He is the loftiest idea in literature. He's the highest personality in philosophy. He's the fundamental doctrine of true theology. He's the only one qualified to be an all-sufficient savior. I wonder if you know him today. He supplies strength for the weak. He's available for the tempted and the tried. He sympathizes and he saves. He strengthens and sustains. He guards and he guides. He heals the sick. He cleans the lepers. He forgives sinners. He discharges debtors. He delivers the captive. He defends the feeble. He blesses the young. He serves the unfortunate. He regards the age. He rewards the diligent and he purifies the meek. I wonder if you know him. He's a key to knowledge. He's a well frame of wisdom. He's a doorway of deliverance. He's a pathway of peace. He's a roadway of righteousness. He's a highway of holiness. He's a gateway of glory. Do you know him? Well, his life is matchless. His goodness is limitless. His mercy is everlasting. His love never changes. His word is enough. His grace is sufficient. His reign is righteous. And his yoke is easy. And his burden is light. I wish I could describe him to you. He's indescribable. He's incomprehensible. He's invincible. He's irresistible. Well, you can't get him out of your mind. You can't, you can't get him off of your head. You can't outlive him, and you can't live without him. Well, the Pharisees couldn't stand him, but they found out they couldn't stop him. Pilate couldn't find any fault in him. Terror couldn't kill him. Death couldn't handle him. And the 